Just about six months ago, maybe even a little less, Pierre, Anne, and Ferenc shared the Nobel Prize in Physics for experimental methods that generate out-of-second pulses of light for the study of electron dynamics in matter. Please help me welcome Professor Agostini. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Uh, is this thing working? <laughs> what I'm supposed to do? Yeah, switch. It has to switch it to to green. That is the switch there. Yeah. And now? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm very happy to be here. And, I had a wonderful time already, and uh, I met a number of people this morning which probably know more about what I'm going to say than myself, but uh, anyway. All right, the title of this talk is From Atto to Zepto, and I'm afraid I'm a little bit cheating about Zepto, but uh, we'll see, uh, okay. And uh, perhaps the idea is uh, to tell you what or why we do physics. I mean, what do we do? And how we choose to do what we are doing. All right, I will first give you <laughs> an answer, a little bit negative. Uh, and this is uh, a quote for, <laughs> for 
from uh, Google. <laughs> Uh, Google says it's Feynman. Uh, I hope it's true, but yeah, if anybody in the room says where Feynman says that, said that or wrote that, uh, please let me know because all I have is uh, is uh, this <laughs> Google <laughs> stuff. Um, all right. Okay, uh, what I want to tell you about uh, is how we went from harmonics, from yeah, uh, the basic harmonic generation uh, to uh, the APT, that's the attosecond pearl strain, uh, by uh, using uh, using risk thing called rabbit, uh, and we'll see what that is. Uh, okay, uh, so what you see here is probably the first <laughs> attosecond pulse trade uh, in, in, in the literature, and uh, this was uh, about 250 attosecond and separated by 1.35 femtosecond. All right. Okay. Uh, this will be uh, an excuse just to recall some memories from 24 years ago. Uh, at the same time, Ferenc took a completely different uh, route and, well, not so different after all. He, he was also using harmonics, but uh, in a different uh, region of, of uh, the spectrum. And uh, he was working on trying to get in uh, isolated atosecond pulses, uh, IAP, and uh, yeah. Uh, right now, the word record from uh, IAP is 43 attosecond. So uh, it has been, yeah, a, a, an increase, uh, I mean, uh, or a decrease of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, duration during the last 20 years of about a factor of five. All right. However, all of this was because of Anne Lillier. And in 1987, Anne discovered this phenomenon of high order harmonics. And uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> when she tells the story, she says that she was looking not for harmonics, but for uh, fluorescence. And it, it was really a surprise. And both a surprise for the kind of spectrum she had and a surprise for the intensity and, and, and how it was uh, uh, constant over a, a large, a large uh, um, <laughs> a large what? A large number of harmonics. Uh, okay, so she says it's another type of light, and we could ask why is it another type of light? I mean, in what sense? And what sense? And uh, we know different type of lights. One is the uh, black body radiation and for different uh, temperature it has different spectrum but that's continuous spectrum and uh, uh, that's one type of light we know. Uh, another type of light is the laser of course which is quasi monochromatic light and uh, this is either CW or pulsed, but uh, that's uh, 
almost monochromatic and uh, in, uh, by comparison the spectrum of the high order harmonics is completely different yeah uh, if you if you look at the spectrum here you see the the number a large number of lines equally spaced and uh, up to a point called uh, the cutoff and therefore it was almost natural to ask the question is this spectrum uh, allowing attosecond pulses or leading to attosecond pulses and the first answer to that question uh, was a yes <laughs> given by uh, Farkash and, and Todd back in 92 and uh, uh, they did a calculation which was almost an exercise uh, uh, calculating uh, what's the Fourier transform of such uh, a spectrum and uh, they discovered that, yeah, the pulse duration they could have is very short and it, it's the period of uh, uh, the laser which make the harmonics uh, divided by 2n, where n is a number of harmonics in, in, your, uh, spec in, in the spectrum. So, uh, yeah, we all knew this paper but we were not sure if we had to believe it or not because one uh, very uh, crucial condition is that they have to be phase locked. Yeah? And if they are phase locked, yes, the result is there. And if they are not phase locked, then it's something like completely different. Actually, what do we do? What do we do about the phase? Uh, there is, back in '96, there was this calculation by Antoine Lullier and Levenstein using a Levenstein model of harmonic generation, and they calculated the phase. Uh, of uh, harmonics up to, oh, I don't know, 69, I guess, and with, uh, in neon with uh, the, their model. And the result was uh, kind of discouraging because the phase looked completely random. And with such random phase, you don't expect at all to have attosecond pulses, but you expect to see uh, uh, much broader pulses, uh, except if you go to the uh, to the cutoff region, where you see this horizontal line and very uh, very calm and quiet, and uh, 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 unfortunately, this is, was this was not very interesting because the number of photons you can get in this region is, is almost zero. I mean, it's going exponentially to zero. Uh, so, what was the phase? We didn't know at that time. All right, measuring at the second pulses, uh, what can we do to measure such, such pulses? All right, we all know that if we have nanosecond pulses, we can use a fast photodiode, and that's enough to see the pulse, pulse in time uh, on your oscilloscope. Uh, for picosecond, it's a bit more demanding, and you have to use a strict camera. And if you have to measure a femtosecond, then you have to use frog. And uh, I will tell you in a minute what frog is. All right, Tra frog was invented by uh, Trebino back in, 
no, I forgot now. <laughs> in the 80s? In the 90s. 90s. Uh, all right. So uh, the, the secret about frog is to do the measurement in the spectral domain, all right? And uh, so you, the most important part of the setup is, is the spectrometer there. Uh, and also, the important part is that you have to do some nonlinear effect. If it's linear, then you lose completely the phase uh, information. All right. So, uh, using this idea of Trebino and uh, applying it to the, uh, the, the harmonic spectrum was not completely obvious, all right? Because the spectrum is such, I mean, it's going into the, uh, uh, the high frequency part of the spectrum and it's, there is no second harmonic crystal for to do that, all right? Okay, uh, so the nonlinear device that we have to use is a two photon and two photon ATI process, except that the, yeah, the intensity of the harmonics is not sufficient to do anything nonlinear. But if you superpose to uh, the harmonics, uh, a laser, then it becomes really feasible. Uh, so here it's a two-color ATI process in which the first photon from the harmonics takes the electron into the continuum, the H bar omega x, and, and then uh, it absorbs another photon or emits another photon from the laser and uh, 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 with an energy which is uh, E plus or minus H bar uh, omega. All right, so this was, as uh, Phil told you, is, was observed in the first time, for the first time, <laughs> a long time ago, uh, 79. And uh, uh, for uh, some time, uh, we, we saw this small result, I had this small peak, and we were kind of afraid that this was, <laughs> yeah, an artifact or something. And uh, uh, so the paper was published very quickly, and uh, uh, almost unfortunately. But uh, a bit later, we found out that uh, with better spectrometer and uh, uh, better laser and uh, yeah, going from the one pulse every three minutes in the first case to the 10 pulse per second in the second case, we could get a much better spectrum and much, uh, we were convinced that this was uh, real. All right, so why do we do physics? <laughs> Not for practical results. Uh, those guys, the three people there, are theorists, French theorists from University Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris. And they published in 96 a Fils survey paper. And in the corner of this paper, there is this calculation, uh, which is uh, a calculation of a three-color ATI spectrum uh, in which we have two consecutive harmonics, omega q and omega q plus one, or plus two, and uh, uh, superposed to the laser who creates the harmonics. So, because only the harmonics are uh, of odd order, they are separated by, uh, the peaks are separated by two omega, and uh, if uh, the, the atom absorbs one more photon from the laser uh, on top of the 
lowest order harmonics or emit a photon from uh, the highest order harmonics, then you add up with the same state. Uh, and this state, uh, because there are two pathways to go to this state, there is a quantum interference and uh, uh, the, the sideband, uh, this state call it, is called the sideband and uh, uh, we will see in a minute uh, what you can do with it. All right. So the idea was is to uh, to measure the sideband amplitude, and uh, it it is from their calculation, it is clear that the sideband amplitude contained an information on the harmonic phase difference, and that's the crucial point. Plus small correction, which is called the atomic phase in the calculation and uh, from which uh, we can derive the photoionization delay as we will see in a moment. All right, so uh, there is a simple equation that will tell you what the phase difference between the harmonics Q and Q plus two are and that's uh, uh, the the, the f original phase of, of this function. So it's very easy to, to see. All right, so uh, that this is an implementation of their uh, theory. Uh, so uh, mostly Arm Muller was photographed here. Uh, is the guy who basically invented that setup and uh, 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 to uh, to implement uh, the, the uh, Valérie Vignard, Richard Tayeb, and uh, Alfred Paquet theory. Uh, so what you do is take your laser and uh, use the central cache to make the uh, profile of this laser uh, um, to make a hole in, in the middle, right? And, uh, but on top of, of that, you, there is a small hole in the cache which allow a central part of the beam to be, also to be uh, transmitted, all right? Then, uh, we had this couple of uh, glass windows that were um, orientable and uh, that we could, you know, uh, position very precisely. And uh, yeah, they, they, uh, uh, they are been given to the Nobel Museum now. Uh, so if you happen to be in Stockholm, you can go to the Nobel Museum and look at them on a shelf. I guess, uh, yeah, I've not seen them myself. Um, all right, okay, and uh, then uh, there is a piece of equipment uh, that's the pinhole there. And the, the role of the pinhole was simply to block the infrared, uh, the, the beam that was generating the harmonics and to block it uh, after the, the harmonic generation. So the harmonics were going in the central part of the beam and they were superposed by construction. They were superposed to uh, the, uh, the laser uh, frequency. All right. So you can see how popular there. And you can see the two students uh, that did the uh, hard work at that time, Elena Thomas and Pierre Baipo, uh, both uh, PhD students. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm not sure how to do that. 
well, ah, I, okay, <laughs> okay. So here you can see a spectrum, and the, the peaks that are almost always there. Uh, the harmonics peaks correspond to harmonics, and the peaks that grow from time to time in the middle are the sidebands. So the idea is that if you measure the phase of the sideband amplitude, then you get access to the phase. Uh, and this uh, is the result. Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five harmonics side, and uh, uh, you can see the phases which are from this measurement. And once you have the amplitude and the phase, then you can uh, uh, reconstruct the time domain, the time domain uh, dependence of the signal. All right, so uh, this is what we had, and this is uh, uh, what was yeah, published in 2001. Uh, it's a long time ago. <laughs> All right, so what about this calculation and the result that we have? Uh, is there a contradiction there? I mean, uh, Clearly, we were doing measurement not in the cutoff region where the phases are supposed to be constant, but uh, somewhere in, in the part of the spectrum which is uh, uh, in, the, in the plateau region. And uh, therefore, we should have observed, I mean, such random phase uh, according to the calculation. All right. Well, the uh, solution to this conundrum is, uh, was given in 98 by a paper by uh, Bellini et al., which uh, is, uh, was a co-worker with Anne Rillier. And uh, what is clear on this result is that the two, there are two amplitudes which are responsible for this uh, random phase that we see on the left. And, uh, uh, but uh, the long and short trajectories, so-called long and short trajectories, have different angular distributions. So uh, the long trajectory was killed by the, uh, the same uh, pinhole that was there for another reason that was there for blocking the infrared beam. And uh, this pinhole is therefore the most, or was the most important piece of equipment, of the equipment. Uh, it was, yeah, a kind of uh, expensive experiment, but uh, this been all five cents or something uh, was probably the most important piece because yeah, without it, uh, the experiment was, would have given something like, like you know, the left. Um, all right, uh, then. Uh, any practical result from all this and from all this attosecond pulse train? Okay, uh, back in 2002, uh, Louis de Moreau, uh, had uh, brilliant success with this picture of a baseball uh, photograph that shows that if the shutter yeah, speed is not short enough, then you cannot, you know, freeze uh, an object which goes 
very fast in the, in the picture. And uh, so uh, it was sort of an idea that was uh, allow him to say that, yeah, if you want to take a picture of electrons, whatever that means, uh, you uh, have to use attosecond pulses because attosecond is the characteristic, characteristic time of those objects in, in the atom. All right. Apparently, it's, we are not yet at this point. I mean, uh, uh, atomic photography is something for the future, maybe, uh, but not quite yet. So, what can we do with an attosecond pulse train? I mean, I sort of, uh, this reminds me the time where we had mock lock laser, but without the buckle cells to isolate one, one pulse. And uh, uh, so, is it so? Can we do anything about that? Yes, okay. First of all, we can measure this small uh, at the atomic phase, uh, so-called atomic phase, and get to the photoionization delay. Then, okay, uh, this is another application that we uh, look at at uh, Ohio State, and uh, it's the, the, the pearl shaping around the Cooper minimum. Uh, then, we should we can explore subcycle physics. Subcycle physics is uh, was invented by uh, those three guys, and uh, I'm very happy to say that Ken Kulantar is in this room. And uh, uh, so the three-step model is back in '93 was invented by those three guys. All right. So the photoionization delays, uh, what is it? Uh, if you have uh, an electron that goes by a potential here, and uh, uh, if you compare the phase it has uh, to the case where no potential is there, then you, you have a diff phase difference which is called here delta. And uh, uh, the derivative of this phase difference uh, with respect to uh, the frequency to omega is called the Wigner delay. Yeah, it's a time, and that has the dimension of a time, and it's called the Wigner delay. So uh, the Wigner delay, OK. So, The uh, atomic phase has two components, the Wigner delay plus the continuum continuum delay, which is not so interesting. All right, so if we want to measure uh, the harmonic phase difference, we have to know the, ato the, the atomic phase. Huh? And we subtract it from the measurement and that's uh, the best you can do. Uh, in our case, we could calculate the phase, uh, the atomic phase, uh, quite precisely. And uh, so we knew uh, how, what to, to uh, subtract from the total phase that, were, that was uh, measured. Uh, inversely, if uh, we want to uh, uh, to have an information about the atomic phase, then we have to know the phase difference of the harmonics. And so this can be done either by using another experiment uh, which measure the, the harmonic phase different phase difference or uh, by difference itself. I mean, sometimes you 
can do the thing by by uh, uh, subtracting or by subtracting the case of, of two states uh, that produce the harmonics. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> why do we do physics? Uh, the small correction had a wonderful career. I mean, a number. I, I put a few titles there, but uh, I mean, I think tens of publications are using uh, the rabbit uh, method and. Uh, to, and then the correction to uh, um, to produce a measurement for the uh, photoionization delay. Uh, okay. And then we come to the zeptosecond <laughs> uh, zeptosecond birth time delay in molecular photoionization. I mean, uh, this is uh, perhaps not uh, really the case of a, a, a zeptosecond ionization pearls like we have in the case of atosecond, but we'll see that in a, in a moment. All right, uh, what happens if uh, the phase, or I mean, if the spectral phase or the spectral, the, the group delay that you have in the upper box is uh, as this shape uh, because of the Cooper minimum. And it turns out that uh, the pulse that you send through it is split into two parts, like uh, is shown in the, in, in the right. Uh, okay, so this was uh, found out in Ohio State back uh, 10 years now. Um, now, another application that we have is the clocking of the electron motion. Uh, so this is an experiment uh, which, is, which has been done recently uh, in, in Ohio State. And uh, the paper has been submitted uh, last, last month uh, to Fizzler of Letters. Uh, so uh, some of the authors, uh, at least one of the authors, is somewhere in the room. Uh, and uh, two of the students already graduated, and, uh, Andrew Piper and Xiao Lu Liu. Uh, have graduated, and uh, so they left the group. Okay, so what to do? Did we do? Okay, uh, we had this atosecond power strain, which was, uh, or which is uh, shown here, as a very short oscillation in in violet, and we could. Delay, uh, we could scan the delay between a laser and this guy. And uh, uh, so we could choose the time where an electron could be ionized with respect to the, the laser that was stressing. Uh, and then we could observe the return time of the electron by observing uh, the double ionization. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we could calculate uh, and uh, uh, the experiment here is, uh, is uh, the, 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 the dots and uh, the calculation is the red curve. So it's, it works very well. So. This is the first time I think you can clock uh, the electron from start from the beginning to the end. I mean, to, from its, uh, its leaving the core and returning to the core. Uh, 
All right. Uh, okay. Now I try to <laughs> to guess what the future of attosecond science is, and uh, yeah, uh, it's hard to tell the future. <laughs> but uh, um, I was yeah sort of impressed by this paper. Uh, which already is already four years old, and uh, uh, it's by the, the group here, uh, the, the uh, LCLS uh, group, and uh, you can see there that uh, compared to the uh, high harmonic uh, situation, which is inside the yellow region. Uh, the points they get are orders of magnitude more powerful. And uh, so they had at least, well, I suppose more than that, but then they had at least two situations with pulses of 600 or 650 uh, electron volt or 900 electron volt and uh, with a pulse duration of 400 attosecond to 280 attosecond. So uh, I, I would guess that this is really something that you cannot really do with harmonic from uh, harmonic generation. Although uh, harmonic generation has uh, the record for the short pulses uh, in, uh, with the two, uh, the two uh, red uh, diamond. Oh, the Zepto. Okay, I go to the Zepto. Uh, the title was a little bit misleading, so I guess uh, I was, yeah, I was confused by the title. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, so it's, they are not using an at the Zepto second pulse, light, light of pulse. Uh, but uh, the, the Zepto second measurement comes from the fact that uh, in hydrogen, the two atoms are uh, 0.74 angstrom apart, and the light takes that time to go from one atom to the other. So it's a sort of, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I, it's really uh, a predom uh, I mean, it's really something that shows that zeptoseconds are not far away, but uh, that's not exactly the way we call it uh, a zeptosecond pulse. Uh, in that, that case, it's just a time measurement, and it was measured by, by um, sort of interference, uh, like uh, two-slit interference, and. Uh, Well, anyway, I would think that uh, zeptosecond, uh, it's, they are not very far from, uh, from us, but they are not still there. All right, so uh, here you have the solution of the rabbit acronym, and the, f the arrow is pointing to the guy who invented him, invented it. And uh, uh, the two the two students are there, uh, Elena and Pierre Mai, and uh, that was taken back uh, uh, three months ago in Stockholm. So the other two are um, Alfred Marquet and uh, and. Um, Ah, what's his name now? Uh, Balcou, Philippe Balcou. 
all right? And this was uh, the crazy OSU party, and uh, <laughs> uh, all the, the people were there in, yeah. The head of the department is at the back. It looks very happy, yeah. Um, uh, the other, uh, you, you can see harm also in that case. All right, so <laughs> don't worry about applications. Nah, I won't see that. <laughs> Thanks for not showing that last joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, were you, are you willing to take some questions? Yes. Okay. So uh, maybe before the question starts, I'll do this one thing with your permission. Uh, since uh, this is uh, also partly sponsored by, by Pulse and Photon Science, we don't let our speakers get away without swag. <laughs> so uh, please accept th this labeled merchandise from us. <laughs> Thank you. So that you can, you can go around the world and be wearing your Stanford Pulse gear Thank you so much. coffee from your Stanford Pulse. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? <laughs> so by the time you did the, measure, the experiment in what, 2000 or 2001, was there already some understanding that, that phase calculation was wrong, or you just you know, did the experiment hoping that it was wrong? The phase calculation, all right. Uh, the phase calculation was discouraging us, yeah. right? Uh, and then we found this result which was okay. The result was okay. The phase were just uh, going about straight. But uh, uh, so, yeah, if, I don't know what to say. Uh, it was clear that there was a reason why the, the theory was that different from the experiment. And I think uh, the reason was the pinhole. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and was, I mean, harmonics, uh, because of phase matching, they are mostly in the direction of the, of the laser. So in most experiments, there is a pinhole. Or if not a pinhole, then it's far away, the far field then, so that the divergence of the long trajectory does not bother you. Uh, so I guess that's the answer. So, so that was the calculation, okay, so uh, probably only a third of the people in the audience would appreciate the business about the long and short trajectories, but was the calculation simply averaging over both? Uh, that I, might certainly be a problem. I guess they had both, yeah? They did have a selection in, in the calculation. So, yeah. But uh, in the experiment, we had the selection. And yeah. There was always a selection. So, so I'm, I'm quite out of field. But whenever I see something of this sort, I start to wonder, how much control do you have in terms of making fancier pulse shapes with that finest resolution? Oh, I mean, if we that? can adjust the phase. Well, or, or in, increase and decrease the field with that kind. Of, can you make like a temporal modulator built around this somehow? Yeah, people didn't try to, to do that, I think. But uh, yeah, they were happy to have attosecond pulses. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, they try to use attosecond pulses, but I agree. I mean, if you can, 
yeah, control the face one way or the other. I mean, in, in some earlier experiment from you, <laughs> uh, you were controlling the faces. I have a question. I remember years ago being amazed with the blood threshold ionization, but I've, I've often wondered what is the functional dependence on power that in terms of total electrons produced in above threshold ionization versus, versus the power that you're using. What, what's the functional dependence? Um, okay, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there, yeah, there was always enough intensity or signal to see the side bed. And the side beds were the crucial element to have the face, right? Uh, there was no problem in seeing, in seeing that, I think, as far as I know. <laughs> in our experiment, it was always uh, very visible. Other questions? Yes? I, I have an infinite number of questions. <laughs> so you said uh, you're seeing dynamics on a zeptosecond timescale. Uh, what do you think are the prospects of getting the pulse length down that far? What's the shorter burst, uh, shortest pulse we can get? Yeah. Yeah, in principle, it, yeah, it depends on how much bandwidth you have. And so that's essentially how much harmonics you can uh, use in, in your spectrum. Uh, for a single atosecond pulses, they had been go going down to 43 atoseconds. And uh, I probably, I would guess that uh, uh, they did have many, many photons <laughs> uh, in, that, in that case. First of all, because they are using the, the, the cutoff region of the spectrum. And uh, yeah, and yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think we can get to the zeptosecond <laughs> uh, region f with, uh, with that. Uh, maybe I'm just pessimistic. There, 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 are, there are certainly uh, people thinking about it, making use of X-ray free electron lasers that don't have the natural limitations of atoms. Put it that way. But Hasn't happened. Is that fair enough? Hasn't happened. Hasn't been measured. Hasn't been measured. <laughs> you can combine harmonics of a free electron laser, you'd have a separate second structure. Uh, of course, doing a rapid kind of measurement at those energies would be very challenging. So, do you feel you are the future? <laughs> I guess you do. What does it take to move from the periodic pulse generation to single pulse of the pulses generation? And what actually is in that? Because you're uh, I don't understand the question. You said, uh, how, how do you get from the pulse train to a single isolated pulse? Oh, OK. Uh, so you have to start from a very short laser pulse, first of all. And then uh, you have to use the part of the spectrum which is in, in the cutoff region. And uh, yeah, <laughs> both things are difficult, and uh, we didn't do that, but uh, Ferenc Krauss did that. And so, yeah, he's uh, an older group also. Uh, yeah, the group who has the, the, the world record now uh, did that, but yeah. We did not. <laughs> we, we did have 
short pulse laser and uh, yeah, maybe you can do that now. Well, I just want to point out that, um, you know, stay, stay tuned to this channel because next month uh, another one of the Nobel laureates this year, Ferenc Krauss, who was the person who did that exact thing, will be giving, giving uh, a colloquium here at Stanford. So we, you, can, uh, you can repeat that question and <laughs> <laughs> hear, hear the latest from that. On the 2024 paper that's coming up, I didn't, uh, it's not obvious to me and might be obvious to you. Where does that, the, both the theory and the experiment agree that the, there's a pre-peak to the big peak? Where's that pre-peak coming from? Or it's, it's obviously obvious. Uh, yes, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Uh, Oh, okay, you mean in the oscillation? Yes. Uh, yeah, you could see that. Um, I'm sorry you could see it. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, know, I don't know even if you are actually working on that or it's just, you know, so you don't have to answer. The other question I had is, what, what kind of minute, what minute repetition laser were you using on your first uh, publication that, that I Yeah, I, I really don't know what the answer is. <laughs> so so you, you saw and it, what you showed in the original rabbit paper with um, with harm and the data that you showed. Um, it, it's clear that there's a large spectral dispersion. That is you know, you measured the phase of a bunch of harmonics, you fit them to a nice curve, that curve wasn't flat. Um, that, that, and that was, the, is that just the, is, is that dispersion just the auto chip or is there other, was there a, another contribution for that? Because that's a, kind of an answer to this question that was asked, yeah, why is, the, why is right. the shape of the retrieved pulse funny? It's because the phase isn't flat, it's a curve. Uh, you mean uh, this, this, yeah. uh, okay, uh, a few years after, in 2004, I guess, uh, a student of Philippe Balcou, uh, Sophie Casamias, and Philippe Balcou published a paper in Fisere where they found out that there was really uh, a second order of it to our point. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, which was better than this, the first order of it. And the second order of it was really more uh, within uh, the theory of uh, harmonic generation and, uh, and of the pulses. Yes, so would it be possible to have some other dispersive medium to compensate for that? Yeah, yeah, in principle, yes. Uh, I'm not sure it has been done yet, but in principle, yes. Yeah, because, uh, yeah. And Anne's group did some, some work on that with uh, thin film, uh, indium, I don't know, thin, thin, thin film filters to try to um, compensate for the and create shorter pulses. Yeah, it's, it's feasible in principle. Okay. Um, well, thanks everyone. I'm just so thrilled to see such a huge crowd. Thank you everyone for coming.